my left is uh, retired Lieutenant General uh, uh, Rich Harding. He retired as the Judge Advocate General for the United States Air Force. And, and just very briefly, he was, he was the top attorney for the Air Force. He was a legal advisor to the Secretary of the Air Force, and, and therefore has a very uh, worded background, and I think will be a real interest to you. So I'm going to get out of his way and, and let you be back. So please welcome uh, Lieutenant General Hart. And we all kind of speculated that the pilot must have a heart attack. Wait a second, 
aviation discipline requires that the co-pilot be in the cockpit. Where's the co-pilot? How could this happen? The Admiral said, all right, break it off. Put that out of your mind. Let's go back to the exercise. And about two or three minutes later, the support pilot staff said, sir, we have another action. The Admiral said, put it on the screen. And we saw the second airplane strike the second tower. And the Admiral, and probably the best thing to do, he said, we're done. Cancel the exercise. That's about a $15 million decision. Because of all those boats that had left the ports, all those bombers that said, bring them home. We're done. We're going to stand in support. And what's going to happen next? He asked the support pilot staff, do we have an air event conference? Which is what we use if we had an incoming missile or an incoming bomber. We would have that comm center, that communication center down there, linked up with all kinds of other people throughout the nation. They said, yes, sir. So we've got the CMOD, the Cheyenne Mountain Operations Center, uh, Cheyenne Mountain in uh, Colorado Springs. Uh, we've got the National Military Command Center. We've got the FAA. And there's some notables online, sir. He said, well, pipe it in. And then loudspeakers, just like in this room, they face us down on the floor. And we heard the voice of uh, Vice President Cheney, the voice of Secretary Rumsfeld. Cheney was already in an uh, <coughs> uh, undisclosed location, <laughs> an alternate location. Um, and Rumsfeld was still, Secretary Rumsfeld was still in the country. About that time, the article said, uh, uh, do we have uh, do we have any indication on who else was hijacked? And the support battle staff, again, there are a lot of people back there behind the wall, said, yes, sir, we've, we've been tracking the field. And said, populate one of the screens. Within a few minutes, we had 10 hijacked aircraft identified. History would show that four of them were actual. The other six we call fog over. When the FAA grounded all those aircraft, sometimes there was something lost in translation. And some foreign pilots decided maybe the appropriate thing to do is get your hijacked squat button there <laughs> and then head for Canada or wherever. So we, there was a lot of there was a little confusion on that. So we worried about that for a little bit. Um, about that time, support pilot staff said, sir, we got another action. Admiral said, put it on the screen. And we saw the aftermath of the Pentagon having been struck. Now, for all of us in that room, we had served in the Pentagon before. You don't get to that room unless you've got a few years and a lot of scar tissue on you from other assignments. So we had served in the Pentagon. It was our home. Uh, the four-star admiral that we worked for said, what side of the Pentagon is that? Bring it up, sir. Um, I want to see it. Show me a schematic. So the Army side, sir. And then we gave, because we were a joint force, we were bunker down there. We gave our Army brothers and sisters our condolences for what had happened. About that time, we heard that the Pentagon had been evacuated. The State Department had been evacuated. Those people were our backup. If you want to call a friend in my business, that's who you call. But they were gone. They were somewhere out in the grass, on the street, trying to get home. The State Department also could have been developed, but they were gone as well. And then a truly odd thing happened. The phone on the Admiral's desk that we would use during the exercise, when the exercise president or the exercise secretary of defense would call, people pretending to be those in those roles, it rang, oh, wait a second, we weren't in an exercise anymore. The Admiral cut the phone, talked for a few seconds, put it down and said, the president will be here in one hour. Prepare to greet the president. But we started to scramble. What would the president be interested in? Uh, it appears that some planes were flown into you know, some valuable uh, national resources. We kind of had a good suspicion as to how that happened and who had done that. Somebody in the back, working on the intelligence slide, screamed out, How do you spell Al Qaeda? So <laughs> guy have that's some ways you can spell Al Qaeda. We're arguing about it. This is really a minor pitiful point in the middle of that day. Maybe the best work that yours truly did that day was say, you know what, it probably doesn't matter how we spell it. Let's just spell it consistently, because I'm pretty sure the president doesn't know how to spell it either. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever we do, spell it consistently, we're done. So all of that was, was working its way through. Yours truly was working on issues dealing with uh, support of um, civilian law enforcement from the military, um, you know, how the you know, conduit of governments. All those kinds of issues that are woven into this. Um, and it had a small staff topside that was, was helping them with it. About then, a, a truly surrealistic event occurred. See, on the loudspeaker above, the duty officer back in the Pentagon, the National Military Command Center, asked the Vice President, Sir, United 93 has turned. 
Sir, we have another bogey that the airmen's talk for unidentified aircraft refusing to respond. Another bogey headed to the National Capital Region. 9-3 is headed to the NCR, the National Capital Region. What should we do? And the Vice President said, take them out. I wrote down take them out at that time because I thought that might be important uh, in the future. <clears throat> what happened next, I didn't see coming at all. The duty officer back in the Pentagon, who was highly trained, and this is why training is so important, pushed back on that a little bit, just to clarify the order, and said, Mr. Vice President, would that be the President's direction directed to shoot down your 993 and the other aircraft? That was what was taken out. And the Vice President repeated, he said, yes, I've talked to the President of Air Force One, take them out. I wrote down, take them out again, but before I could complete that time, writing the time down, the person next to me, about two feet away, is the director of staff for the command, the strategic command. He turned and looked at me, and eyeball to eyeball said, can we do that? Can we do that? Contemplate the unthinkable. There are 40 innocent souls on United 93. It's headed to the National Capital Region. Our best guess is it's going to go to the Capitol. How do you weigh that? What's your response going to be? Can we do that? Who are you going to call when nobody's home? And even if they were home, those backup people in the Pentagon, you don't have time to talk to them. United 93 is 15 minutes out. Jets are going to make it there on time, they got to go now. Can we do that? Sometimes you really stand all alone. You have what you brought, your education, your experience, and that's it. And there's no time to call for backup or help. That was one of those times. And we all face 9-11 moments. But from that point forward, every issue that we face in the law of war, in the law against terrorism, it started with the same question. Can we do that? Sometimes we got the answer right, sometimes we got it less right. <laughs> and we adjusted fire, as we say, and came up with a better answer. But that was the first day. And ever since then, we've had a number of other days where we've asked the same question. And usually when I tell this story, somebody will say, so what did you say to the director's staff? And we say, can we do that? And everybody was kind of listening, waiting for the answer. And my answer is, I'm not going to tell you. Why? Because my answer is not important. But the question sure is important. When we do that as an important question that all of us ought to consider and be prepared for, particularly those of us that enter into this field of national security. It's important to be prepared for those days. And you know the rest of the story. F-15s were diverted to DC, intercepted 99-3, 9-3 never made it, crashed in a field in Shanksville, and passengers took over. We didn't know that, by the way, back in the bunker no more. Well, we shot them down for a few days until we learned that uh, uh, the, the back brief that that had not occurred. The president did arrive. He was briefed. Perhaps the best um, best decision he made that day was to go home. He said, I'm not going to stay in the hole in no Omaha. The nation needs to see me back in the White House if he left. But we were prepared to, to entertain him that night. So what were the issues that we addressed post 9-11 that started with the question, can we do that? The very first issue that day in the command center was this. What are we dealing with? Is this law enforcement or is this an act of war? That's an important distinction because depending upon which of those two you pick, it leads you in different directions. If it's law enforcement, then it's a policing action. And I need to apprehend the felons, those that plan this. If they resist apprehension, <coughs> shoot or kill them. If they're in another nation's territory, we have to pay attention to that sovereign. So we have to ask that sovereign to do that. But wait a second, they're in Afghanistan, and the sovereign there right now is the Taliban, who's kind of supported them in a big way to this point. And if you know, allow them to stay there and operate out of Afghanistan. If it's law enforcement, when I capture them, I'm going to try them, and the punishment will be issued by a court of law. But if this is an act of war, 
then I can shoot them today, even if they're asleep in their beds as a status target, because the law of war allows me, allows uh, a belligerent to do that. And if I capture them, I can detain them until the end of hostilities, which may be, in fact, forever. You know, people tend to think of World War II as a model for how wars ought to be run. Well, all right, 1939 to 1945, active hostilities with the, with the Nazi Empire and, with the, uh, and from 41 on with the Empire of Japan. We retained those EPWs as enemy prisoners of war for the duration, and they retained ours, our captured troops. But at the end of hostilities, they were repatriated. Same thing applies here if this is war, but it's kind of a unique war, isn't it? Because it's not a nation state. It's something that we like to refer to as a non-state actor. It's an organization that doesn't really have an address. So if we attack them in Afghanistan and they move to Pakistan, which they did do, or move to Iraq, or move to the Majid, to North Africa, um, we're still at war with the organization. So when does that war end? <coughs> because only then, if this is war, do we release those detainees. So that's an important distinction. Which of these two do we pick? The administration says war. We're going to pick war. And that's not the first time we picked war against a non-state actor. You have to go back to, um, I think it's Madison, back to the Barbary Pirates, before you find kind of a similar event where we picked a uh, you know, object of war against an organization but it's not unheard of, but it's extremely rare. So we said this is war, and the law of armed conflict applies. So from there, we made other decisions based on that juncture, that Y in the road, the crossroads. We said that those that are captured need to be detained until the end of hostilities. Now, some of us back in the Pentagon said, and in and, and those command uh, uh, spots like Omaha, said, you know what? When we do that, call this war, and retain those prisoners, which we're going to call illegal combatants. Why are they illegal? Because you need the connection says to be a legal combatant and a protected status. You must wear a uniform. You must operate under command structure. You must bear arms openly. Those are the indicia of being a lawful combatant. The enemy we were fighting did none of those things. Now, in fairness, that's a Western view of combatancy. It comes from the Geneva Convention. Hate conventions, all of that was westernized law. They're not necessarily disobeying that law, it's just that's not their cultural background. So they're illegal combatants. The Convention says they're entitled to some privileges under Common Article 3, but not all of the Geneva Convention. So what do we, so both some of us say, you know what, we think we're gonna be keeping these people for a very long time. Why? Because this war looks like a forever kind of thing. How long has Israel been combating terrorism? Now, they learned to coexist with terrorism, degrade it, keep it low, and as, as, as little effect as possible, but will they ever defeat it? So that was really the second issue we came up with. If you declare war against terrorism, is it ever winnable? We declared war on things other than nation states before. Those of us that were alive in the 60s, we had a war against war on poverty. In the 70s, we had a war on drugs. In the 80s, we had a war on crime. How are those wars going? <laughs> now we declare war on terrorism. Well, what is terrorism? It's not a specific, necessary, necessarily identified group of people. It's a tactic. So how do you declare war on a tactic? And why do we see so much of it? Because it works. It's a tactic that actually does work, and there have been nation states that have succumbed to terrorist attacks or different ills over the course of time. It's a poor man's weapon. If you face an enemy like the United States, it has all this great firepower. And you've got these sophisticated tanks, and you've got sophisticated weaponry at sea, and you've got fifth generation fighters, and you've got space air, spacecraft that can see all kinds of things, and read, um, read signals from cell phones. When you face that kind of enemy, what can you bring? Is it likely that the Taliban anytime soon is going to develop with a generation fighter? No. Not going to happen. So how do they fight an enemy? They do it asymmetrically. They use terrorism. It's a poor man's tool. And it's worked before we're not the first to choose this. Think about our own revolution. 
We weren't terrorists, but think about that revolution for just a second. We faced the greatest army on the planet. George Washington gets lots of accolades for winning the revolution, eight years of war. What he really did, in fairness, not a huge George Washington fan, as a military historian, I'm a huge fan. What he really did is didn't lose the war. He outweighed the British, and they went home. He was fighting something with an insurgency, another poor man's weapon. He was really at picking a conflict and always having an exit strategy, planning to ultimately perhaps lose, but leave the British a little bit at a time to the point where Parliament would say we're done. And that's exactly what happened. So how do you fight terrorists and how do you fight insurgencies? And that's really what we've learned in the last many, in many of the interviews. years. So if we're going to pick a war against terrorists, we even call this a global war against terrorism, we have to, I think, be realistic and realize we may never win it in a traditional sense. We can degrade it, we can reduce it, but we may never win it. We also have to understand that when we do intercede in another territory, like Afghanistan or Iraq, or perhaps even in Syria in the future, um, that that terrorist enemy can degrade into an insurgency. And there's a lot of science on insurgency. So we have to realize that that science says that it takes a couple of decades to beat an insurgency. The ones that are really hard to beat are the ones that have a neighboring country that support them. And there are a lot of examples of that kind of activity occurring. The British were, uh, probably have the best uh, credibility or claim that defeated an insurgency in Malaya. Uh, it took them 30 years. <laughs> 30 years. And the American people have the patience for a 30-year war. Look what's happening in Afghanistan. We've been there for 14 years now. 9,800 troops. By the end of 17, we're going to go down to 5,500, according to the current administration's plans. Can you win an insurgency? Can you fight a counterinsurgency in Afghanistan with 5,500? Mm -hmm. It's difficult to imagine. So the American people like quick wars, wars that they can win. They like a Gulf War, the first Gulf War. What did that mean? <laughs> The first Gulf War was completely different from what we face today. First Gulf War, you had a whole bunch of peer to peer. You had Saddam the fourth largest on the planet, in the desert, with nothing else around it. And the Air Force bombed it for a couple of months. It was an easy target. It was dumb to put tanks out there. They even tried burying some of the tanks, but you could see the artillery too. So we bombed them, and then we took an army approach and peer-to-peer -peer combat, army to army, kinetic fight, and we won that very quickly. In part because that conflict, victory was not defined as going into Iraq. So they went off into the road to Basra, remember that? And came back into Iraq, and we were done. And we won. General Schwarzkopf did a great job. He's a hero, everybody loves American Armed Forces, as they should. But that's a war that we're probably never going to fight in the near term. This was a dumb war. Saddam was not a smart tactician or strategist. Putting that army out of the was kind of stupid. <clears throat> so we fight a different enemy today. We fight a guy with a rifle that lives perhaps in a hut or perhaps in a cave who's difficult to find, who will put the rifle down and meld into the population, who doesn't wear a badge or a uniform, and says, hey, I'm the bad guy. The only way to stop that kind of a person, that kind of an armed force, is to get into the population centers. That's counterinsurgency. To build an economy that people can make a living on, <coughs> being paid five dollars a day by the town. That takes a long time. It takes more than a military force. It takes all the uh, tools of uh, power that we have, economic, diplomatic, um, USA, all of those forces need to converge. And the question is, will the American people have enough patience to allow that to work? We, like Israel, may need to learn to coexist with terrorism. An important point that needs to be made here is that we are not at war with Islam. We're in a political season, and it's really unfortunate some of the statements that we're hearing, because those statements get good people killed. They get my people killed, the people that work with me in uniform. When you say we're at war with radical Islam, it gets translated back, just like the old game of telephone used to move a message along. By the time it gets to the Middle East, it's very simplified. 
we're at war with Islam. If a politician that wants to be the President of the United States says we're at war with Islamists, then the message gets back to those that weren't radicalized that we've declared war against Islam. So you want to swell the ranks of the bad guys, of the terrorists? Do that. What we're at war with is a perversion with use of religion, a perversion of what Islam uh, really means. So under Islam, it, it's a kind of moral sin to commit suicide. So why are all these people striking on suicide vests? You have to listen to the teachings that followed Muhammad, the prophet, peace be to his name, to, to realize that that is really not what Islam stands for. Islam stands for peace. You have to understand the history of the early caliphate after Muhammad to understand that Islam offered the olive branch to the Jewish populations and the Christian populations. They call them people of the book. They all believed in the same book. An important prophet in Islam is Jesus. It goes all the way back to Abraham. There's a common thread, and they believe that those monotheists were all to be honored. Now, they would tax monotheists that weren't Islamic, that weren't Muslim, but they didn't force conversions at the end of the story. For the polytheists, it was different. So their approach was different. So there's this misnomer on the Western side that somehow there's a lack of tolerance. I grew up in that neighborhood, in Pakistan, in, in Lebanon. Um, I will tell you that I was a Christian minority in a group that was largely Islamic. There were a few other religious um, sects there, but uh, I was never treated with more respect than when I was growing up as a, as a child in that environment. So that's not Islam. But there are some crazies out there that want to aggrandize their position by converting Islam to suggest that somehow your life will be so much better in the afterlife if you seek martyrdom by wearing a suicide mask. We need to worry about that. We need to try to get in front of that message. It's really a battle of ideologies more than it is of religion. It never has been a battle of religion. It's been a battle of ideology. And we need to get in front of that with the counter ideology. And I think slowly we're doing that. Um, the vast silent majority in Islam, uh, uh, I am convinced, do not believe that this is an appropriate approach, the terrorist approach to martyrdom. And they have a difficult time disclosing that because when they do, they themselves become a target of terrorism. So put yourselves in their shoes, maybe you'll understand why they're the silent majority. The other thing we learned was that technology really improves combat capabilities. So we had Barely, we had a prototype for, for Predator. And uh, we were told, get it over to Afghanistan, and we did it. So the first few targets that we shot, um, frankly, out of Omaha, this is unclassified. Out of Omaha, by, by video link to other command elements, used Predator feed. Predator is a, a drone, if you will. Originally, we called it a, a, a UAV, a unmanned aerial vehicle. We didn't like that name much. Somebody pointed out, hey, you know, when the automobile was first invented, what did we call it? None of us were alive at that time, but it was called a uh, horseless carriage. You called it that which it is not. But we did the same thing with the Predator. What, what is a Predator? Well, it's a pilotless aircraft. Um, so we changed the name to remotely piloted um, aircraft, RPA. But the media really likes drones. The Air Force kind of cringes when they hear drones because that's something that's tied on the back end of another airplane and you shoot at it. Uh, <laughs> But, okay, we'll, we'll accept drone. We had a drone, we had a, a, one over there and then another, and it took great aerial shots, but we had to bring in F-16s and other aircraft to actually shoot the targets that had been kind of Later, it got weaponized, meaning we, we put a Hellfire missile on there, and we started using it. Much later, the CIA said to ask for and the CIA, is to public knowledge now, and this is uh, it was based on any classified information, but the CIA, uh, um, by all media accounts, has been using drones in Afghanistan and uh, other environments. Which was a change for CIA. CIA worked from an intel gathering organization into a combatant organization. What did that do for CIA? I think that's a fair question. Are they less sufficient and competent in, in, in the classification, in the intel gathering portion of what they do? 
or is the intel gathering portion of what they do is really beating their targeting self, which is applying the predator as a weapon. So it depends on what you want in the way of, a, of an armed force. Now they are not in uniforms as well, so they're not privileged. But the chances of them being captured anytime soon is probably not great. But isn't it interesting that CIA's role has almost become a Department of Defense role, which is a traditional Department of Defense role. So there are those that advocate those predators need to go back to the Department of Defense and let them run the war and CIA you get back to the intel gathering part that you do so well, or have done so well over the years. So that was the advantage of technology. And it really is kind of neat when you have, if you're, a, uh, <clears throat> if you're an operator, to have an unblinking eye on a predator that full motion video camera, and you're watching who comes and goes from this target for days. You don't have that option in F-16. You've got about 10 seconds to make a decision. And you got a little bitty, little bitty box down there on the console that shows you what the targeting box looks like. Very difficult, very easy to, more easy to make a mistake than with a predator. So a predator gave us that kind of unblinking eye, that kind of capability. But along with that, the development of smart bombs and the first Gulf War and the Predator and that unblinking eye came a different kind of reality that we've had to address and certainly make peace with. And that is the concept of collateral damages. You know, in the law of war, as we said, this was a war. In the law of war, you're allowed to shoot the enemy. Right? If you like first identify there's military utility here to this target, it's a tank, it's a, a gaggle of troops. Um, if you're sure that it's not a protected site like a mosque or a hospital. You're not allowed to target people. We call that the principle of discrimination. We don't target civilians. And you have to ensure that, it, that there is an excessive collateral damage. Well, that term excessive collateral damage has never been defined. That's, all this is a body of law that doesn't come from a treaty. It comes from something we call customary international law. It's developed by um, by countries over the course of you know, decades. In fact, our customary international law goes back to St. Augustine. You know, we talked about the, uh, uh, joint, or the uh, just war theory. So it goes back you know, to literally, I guess, this century. And we've developed that in the Western world about the rules of chivalry and the rules of what a just war kind of looks like to develop this body of customary law that's accepted internationally. So when we fly a Predator with a weapon on board, and you ask, is the collateral damage excessive? When you have smart bombs with the capability of putting a small diameter bomb, low blast uh, radius, um, through the window, the third window on the third floor, and take out two or three officers, you're expected, the expectation is, that excessive collateral damage has been limited. We're not talking about thousands dying or it's acceptable. Maybe just one civilian innocent is unacceptable. So that collateral damage, what is accessible collateral damage, has been reduced because our weaponry has got better over the course of time. And it got to the point in Afghanistan where they were toying with the idea that the only acceptable collateral damage is zero civilian casualties. Well, the enemy heard that. I don't know what to do now. Grab up all those children. You guys follow us. So we're going to live with you. We're going to we're going to bivouac in schools. We're going to live in populated areas because the United States has zero as collateral damage. And if they do fire on us, we're going to make a big PR effort and win in the court of public opinion that they killed innocents. And even if they don't kill innocents, we're going to kind of make a blood crash that they did. And we do we do kill innocents. Now go back to World War II before we get smart bombs and predators. What was acceptable collateral damage? You know, we fought the Empire of Japan. We dropped two atomic bombs on Japan. Do you, do you realize that the casualties, the collateral damage, civilian casualties from the conventional bombing campaign that preceded them were four times greater than the total number of uh, innocent deaths in Nagasaki and Hiroshima? Four times greater. The British bombed at night in the European theater. And uh, the level of civilian casualties was usually in the, in the thousands every night. But we don't live in the tank today in those days of carpet bombing. Uh, instead, we live in the day of a smart bomb and the ability to place it exactly where it needs to be. 
So the burden on us is growing over the course of years internationally. The burden is growing. Why should we care about that? Because A, it's a violation of international law to see to have excessive flight advantage. But B, you can't build a coalition if you're upsetting all of your allies. They're not going to come to the next war if we can't prove that we are everything we say. So it's important to, to, to follow that regimen uh, strictly. No one will ever define what um, excessive means under international law because that would be foolish to define an exact number. But it certainly has gone down over the course of years. And then we swept up all the bad guys, in, uh, largely in Afghanistan, but in some other countries. CIA, it's well known, and according to the media, had some black sites where they were doing interrogations of different folks. Uh, Bagram, a base in Afghanistan, had a confinement facility, a detention facility that wasn't very nice. So we built a new one outside Bagram called Parwan. I've been there three times. It's an excellent facility. The irony is, is that the military police that were guarding the facility were in the bud and in tents outside the facility, and the detainees were uncomforted, uh, you know, heat running. Showers, all that good stuff inside. But it, it's an excellent facility. We have since turned that over to the Afghans. Uh, early on, we made uh, a decision we need to have a central facility. And there was a dialogue of where should that central facility be? Uh, a couple of us have recommended some sites in the United States. Those were rejected. And today, the speculation is that the reason it was those were rejected is because we were looking for a site, the United States was looking for a site outside the jurisdictional limits of the courts. You know, Article 3 of the Constitution talks about the court process. It says that one of the most important writs of law is the writ of habeas corpus. You can get that by going into court. What happens if your detention facility isn't in the United States? So we pick Guantanamo. And it's a wonderful facility down there. It's very expensive, very high class in the courtroom down there. The Supreme Court took a look at Guantanamo, gosh, almost uh, what, eight years ago now. And um, nine years ago now. And Hamdi said, and, and in the cases that followed, said, you know what? It doesn't matter that you're not inside the magic border of the United States. You exercise so much control in Guantanamo that we're going to allow the writ of habeas corpus to exist for detainees in Guantanamo. So we've seen a lot of habeas litigation in the United States on behalf of those detainees. That's not a bad thing at all. And some of them, uh, in fact, have been released. We were trying to release a number of Uyghurs, um, terrorists from a, um, uh, Muslim and, and uh, a religious choice uh, in, uh, in China. <clears throat> we're training in, in Afghanistan, and we have to sweep them up in the middle of that conflict, but they never had, we believe, uh, aspirations to attack the United States. They were really worried about China. So how do you get them back? We can't send them to China because the Chinese don't necessarily appreciate what they wanted to do. So, you, so human rights law says don't send them back to China. So we were looking for a place. So a lot of them wound up in the Caribbean, um, but you know, they're leading full lives now. So we're trying. How do you how do you deal with this endless, the worst of the worst that are still at one time, and that's going to be a, a hard thing for us to, to deal with. We dealt with enhanced interrogation techniques. First time we heard of it on the uniform side was when we got reports back from Afghanistan and Iraq. They said, somebody I hear one over here. Well, what, what's with this waterboarding stuff? Um, <clears throat> so we started asking questions. There was a reason, I think, that the uniform lawyers weren't asked about the propriety of deviating from the Army manual on interrogations and using enhanced interrogation techniques. Instead, the opinion was written by a law professor from Berkeley who was on loan. And he said, yeah, you know, you can do that. It's really not. Uh, it's really not torture. Well, all of us would say, in, in almost to a, a, a man and woman of us, uh, that it is torture. John McCain, who is the only member of Congress who's been an enemy prisoner of war, says it's torture. And he knows, I think he knows what torture is all about. So we've uh, abandoned that approach and retooled uh, and used now the Army Manual, and we're no longer uh, pursuing those uh, enhanced interrogation techniques. And here's, here's an issue that I think is perhaps most important. Um, we, uh, in the past, have adhered to the Constitution fairly well on the following point. Article 1, rather than the Constitution, Article 1 talks about what? Uh, Congress, Article 2, uh, President, Article 3, the courts, right? So Article 1 says one of the congressional powers is the power to declare war. And 
the power to equip an army. Article 2 says one of the president's powers is the power of the commander in chief. That's really modeled after the vision of Washington. Washington was our commander in chief, very successful. So they kind of had Washington in mind, I think, when they wrote this. The Federalist Papers even talk about it as we, were, as, the, as we were attempting to sell the Constitution through the ratification process. Alexander Hamilton said, look, there's a difference between these two things, power to declare war and the power uh, to be the commander in chief. He said the King of England has both of those powers. But we are not building the King of England. We're building the President of the United States. So we want to separate them. And we want the people to have a voice on when we go to war. But when we do, we want to stay out of the President's way as the commander in chief. Washington was the only president to ever take the field with his army. He did the Whiskey Rebellion. That was the last time. Uh, since then, the president served as the commander in chief. The guy that works for him, or the woman that works for him, is Secretary of Defense. And all those commanders out of the field, like that four star admiral that I worked for in Omaha, worked for the Secretary of Defense and in turn for the president. So he is the commander. So after 9 11, on the 18th of September, we had the authorization to use force, which is kind of like a declaration of war because it came from Congress and said, You can attack those people that brought us 9 11, which would be the Al Qaeda and the Taliban. 2002, we had another authorization to use military force against Saddam and the Iraq. But we haven't had another one since. But where, where have we gone since that time? Well, we've gone into Yemen. One of the predators over there, Milwaukee was killed in Yemen by a predator strike. We'd gone to Libya. A lot of airmen flew over Libya. And we took down Gaddafi. Some argued that's really not war because you shouldn't put the boots on the ground. Tell that to the airmen that were flying those airplanes. <laughs> and they worried about being shot. It was war. We're getting ready to go into Syria. In fact, we're in there today with boots on the ground. Where are the, where are the authorizations to use forces against all of those threats? Well, they're not existing. Under the Bush administration, people started to argue, you know what? Article 2, the power to be the commander in chief, is all encompassing. And that includes the power to decide when to go to war. But if that were true, then why would Congress give an authorization? Why would the, the, the Constitutional Convention give an authorization to a Congress that's meaningless. There's got to be some meaning behind the ability to declare war. So Article 2, the President's powers of energy, can't be that broad. There are people more recently, under the Obama administration, that have said, okay, well, you know, when you get an authorization to use war in Congress, it includes not only that target, but all the associated forces. Where did that come from? When I mean, you press them and says, well, it came from the law of co-belligerency. Well, the law of co-belligerency in international law, traditional international law, customary international law, says that co-belligerents aren't allowed the protection of, um, of, of a uh, non-combatant if they join forces. We're not, but the Constitutional Convention never was worried about that, the idea of an associated force of co-belligerency. And if we're really worried about code belligerency, why don't we call it code belligerency instead of associated force? Associated force means more than code belligerence. Does it mean anybody that supports the bank guy that was authorized in 9 11? Because there's a whole long list. There are a lot of people. Bank of America, I'm sure, has had funds that have moved through there, ultimately, unwittingly, in support of others. Other banks have as well, of other of terrorists. Are they associated forces? Where does this end? Originally, the law review was article was written by some folks that worked in the Bush administration that talked about this, and they said there's a historical precedent for associated forces going to war with associated forces. And if you read down there, in the book, the only historical precedent is World War II, and they cite the North African campaign for the Vichy French that were associated with uh, that were ruling in North Africa with the consent of the Nazi Empire, uh, were attacked. They said that was an associated force and Congress never authorized an attack. The fact of the matter was, Marshall, General Marshall, Robert Eisenhower, had taken on the Vichy French, but to fire only when fired upon. We lost hundreds in the Gulf of Algiers because they were told not to fire because the French were our allies on our enemy. So we waited. 
waited until we retired long we lost a couple of vessels, and then we fired them. That's a false historical precedent. So we've got this notion of associated forces. It really doesn't fit anywhere in international law immediately or in domestic law. But we're trying to work our way through that. So the administration says, you know what, we really need another authorization for Syria. But if you read the, the words carefully of the administration time, it's not because it's legally required, we just think it's politically the right thing to do. We get Congress to kind of sign up to this. No, it's politically, it's legally required, according to the Constitution. So to argue that air wars aren't real wars, that you have to have boots on the ground, that everybody that's associated with um, uh, Al-Qaeda and the Taliban are somehow related to each other, is, is just a fiction. In fact, those that are in um, uh, ISIS, uh, Daesh, if you will, ISIS in, in Syria and Iraq, uh, despise Osama bin Laden. Osama said, it's too early for the caliphate. Don't do that, it will fail. And they did it anyway. At his behest, they asked, they asked, do not do this. And they did it. They have a suicide apocalyptic kind of vision of what's going to happen. This grand battle. Um, according to the writings modeled in the Quran, uh, will occur um, in, uh, in, in the northern part of their territory where the forces of, of um, the Caliphate will fight the forces of Rome, which is now the forces of the West, which is largely the forces of the United States. And then this apocalyptic battle is going to occur. Their version of the Antichrist will occur shortly thereafter. Um, Jesus is involved in that as a prophet coming back to now. So they believe in all of that. Osama wasn't about that. He had a different approach. He was about calling, bringing the United States, bleeding the United States, and convincing them never to come back. And then developing the Caliphate. He thought these people were rich. So that's an important distinction, an important thing that we really do need to have in authorization of these I'll tell you the reason why I don't think we're going to get one. There are two reasons. One, politically, it's dangerous to vote up in war because you just might be wrong. What happens when you're on voting a war up and they were wrong and it turns out to be a bad idea? How many politicians today have to explain why they voted up for a war in Iraq years ago in 2003? That's emblematic of that fact. And secondly, we don't have a draft. We don't have a draft. I'm going to say something. I hope I don't upset anybody in the room. But without a draft, the I care factor starts to go down a little bit. They have an all volunteer force. And you have an all volunteer force, unlike the war in Vietnam, the population perhaps cares a little bit, not as much as they did at that time. When your son or daughter, or you, and when I was 18, I thought, like every other 18 year old, I'm going to Vietnam. That's no longer true. And uh, at the risk of sending a little radical, it's easy to send somebody else's hate off to it. Or to not care whether Congress authorizes that. So, that's the unvarnished opinion of one each retired general. <laughs> I'd be happy to take any questions. I know you, a lot of you got to run off the class and I certainly understand that uh, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to entertain. I got a question. Sure. Uh, based on your long experience, why does the civil uh, disciplinary have not reached a decision to throw out a side of government, even though the decision to take that that would be good in the moment. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, and <coughs> Libya, Gaddafi was considered not a friend of the United States for decades. So, you know, Pan Am, the shoot down of the Pan Am flight, it, it was hostile for years and years and years. So, the predicate to your question, I dispute a little bit because Gaddafi was out there on the strength for a long time. Secondly, Syria is a difficult situation right now, particularly with the Russians involved. Um, but Assad has never been considered a uh, ally of the United States. But it's very, uh, very, very, very um, there are two different kinds of operations. And I think what you really need on here is we have the use of military force to defend the United States, which is the traditional way to go to war. And then there's something called humanitarian operations. Those are important things, but it's a different body of law. That body of law really stems from the belief that organizations like the UN and NATO really ought to need to take the lead in something like that. 
So I think you see the United States being drawn into the conflict in Syria out of not so much, uh, well, out of fear of Daesh, out of fear of ISIS, ISIL, if you will, um, uh, than it is uh, of the need to um, overthrow uh, Assad. Now, President uh, gosh, John Quincy Adams, this is my favorite quote of an early American president, was asked at his time, this is 1824, and they were saying, you know, there's a lot of democracies out there and they're under attack. We need to go help defend them against all these monarchies that are trying to, to pay them and to destroy them. And, uh, and, and, and uh, John Quincy Adams is a real pragmatist. And he said, you know, it's not the business of the United States to attack monsters. And Verter said, the reason is, is because well, with our resources, our power, we need to worry about our own self-defense. So if it's in our national interest to defend this nation, to attack another, we will. But there are a lot of monsters in the world. And if we go out trying to kill monsters, we're not going to have anything left for defense. That's kind of what John Quincy Adams was saying. And I think that was true in 1824, and I think it's true today. So when we look at Syria and Iraq and in the, the Caliphate area, is ISIS a threat to the vital interest of the United States? And the answer to that might very well be yes. Now, is Assad? That's the same question that comes to Assad. Now, if Assad is collateral, if, if Assad necessarily falls in order to attack ISIS, then that's a different issue. But we're still motivated by self-defense. That's the important distinction. Um, and I think humanitarian operations are great. We've been to Haiti, we've been to uh, Kosovo. We did a lot of things in the name of, and the Bosnia in the name of humanitarian operations. They largely been under that international umbrella. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. All right, so who else? Please. How significant do you think the threat of ISIS is in the United States? Yeah. Um, clearly, their recruiting tool has been to attack the West, at least um, in their propaganda. And it's worked. So we've had people that joined ISIS from the United States, from England, from France. So that's working for them. Um, if not stopped, they're just going to continue to grow and become a bigger and bigger problem. So I think we can anticipate today that it's important to get in front of this. Um, the caliphate by itself is not a bad thing. Not a bad thing at all. That part of the world lived under a caliphate for years. Peaceful lived under a caliphate for years. Um, and they expanded the caliphate over the course of time under the polytheistic um, uh, uh, regions. But it worked out pretty well for them. So that's kind of their historical model. What's wrong about this is a caliphate that feeds on that apocalyptic vision. It says the only way we can aggrandize our future is to attack the West. Well, that hurts us on the self defense side. Give God need to be motivated by self defense and national interest. That says, yeah, we've got to worry about this. Uh, ISIS had developed and didn't declare the United States as the enemy, which is, you know, Brown declared the United States as a great state years ago. But if they had to use us as the poster child for why you need to fight for California, you know, which was to kill Westerners and attack America, then we wouldn't have that national interest. We wouldn't have that self-defense self platform. But if we stay true to our to the law and to our own goals of, of self-defense, International, we're going to be fine. But I think that does drive us to look at ISIS. And again, it's complicated now that the Russians are doing it, but it's the Yeah, do that. Anybody else? Which, um, so, terrorists, since Saddam, have been like abusing the rules of law uh, just in the most simple way, as you mentioned earlier. Uh, and then they, they abuse the fact that the U.S. abided by these laws uh, for the most part. But uh, my question was, and, and my understanding is that the U.S. in order to prevent that is uh, like we just use more early intelligence and collective action in more precise decisions. Uh, my question is, do you think we should take a step further um, beyond the Terrorists are different from the state and how we move around. 
for our research. Did I answer your question? Yeah, so if you would just um, stay within the rules of law, whether it's a terrorist or a state. Yeah, we always have to follow the rules of law. Here's the reason why. It's not, not just because it's the right thing to do. We are a nation of laws. But because when we fail to do that and tell the enemy and the rest of the world, you know, the United States is great because we are a nation of laws. No one is above or beneath the law. Our actions speak louder than our words. When we demonstrate that that's not true because of what we did in a particular case, um, or it's suggested that it's not true, then we really start losing strategically um, the fight. So when we go to war, we have to go to war with our values. If we're going to win those kind of fights. If we're going to turn Afghanistan into a peace loving country, we've got to show them that that's ultimately the other way we live, the rule we live by. So we can't, you know, criticize the enemy for doing something and take an approach that looks a whole lot like that. Abu Ghraib, remember the prison, you know, stacking all the detainees and the dogs and all that stuff? You know, that was probably the biggest strategic defeat we had in Iraq. Nobody got killed. One of those photographs that went out. Emboldened the enemy and they said, there it is. That's the United States that said that there are national laws. Look what they're doing. We would never do that under Islam. You know, strip people down, make it like that, take pictures, have dogs on them. That was a strategic defeat. The worst we suffered in life. So that's why it's important to stay close to your values and your world. Otherwise, we don't win. Any other questions? Please. Um, I was wondering what the national interest was behind getting involved in, uh, like, air bombing the Houthis. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, Salah, the president of uh, Yemen, was a good ally in Yemen that we've had. I mean, you know, he had some detractors, so he's out of office. So now what do we have in Yemen? Um, and there are those who argue that Yemen is an extension of Al-Qaeda. In other words, it's an associated force. So what we're really after is Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula. But I would suggest that Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula and Al-Qaeda Central, what they call in Afghanistan, have two different organizations. Um, Al-Nusra up in Syria, people say, well, that's part of Al-Qaeda. No, that really is. A lot of these branches of Al-Qaeda, these independent cells, <coughs> did not listen to the Osama bin Laden and he pleaded with them to go in a different path. So to say somehow today they're an associated force, we don't need an additional authorization. I think kind of misses some of the history of what's happened in that kind of world. Just because you share the same name doesn't mean you're the same organization. Now if you are the same organization, um, then yeah, we've got an authorization to use force. But a lot of these, in particular, in the Use examples of the extreme purposes of illustration, and that's the Syrian piece. And Al Nusra, um, ISIS, all of those are, are the heirs of Al Qaeda. There's something new and different. Um, Libya is another one. Libya now has Al Qaeda, but at the time we went there, they did. Um, so all of those are great questions. Why is it important that Congress declare war? Not only because the Constitution says that that's their job and responsibility, but it causes a national debate to occur. We have elected representatives in the House of Congress. They carry our messages. They will call the general officers in and say, what is your strategy? They do the not completely because we don't have this vote up or down on whether or not we need to go to you name the country, an authorization of these force. And when we do, there's a full airing of these things. And I think that's often important. So, you bet.